Okay, welcome back. Today I'm going to be doing another book review, and this time I'm going to be talking about John Carlton's book, on The Entrepreneur's Guide to Getting Your Shit Together. So, if you need to get your shit together and you're an entrepreneur or you're hoping to be one, then this book is probably a good place to start. Uh, John Carlton's another copywriter, and you know he's had a lot of success uh, studying under some really you know great people like Gary Halbert. Um, so. He's written this book, which is, I guess, from a writing perspective, but it also applies to, to doing business and, and ge in general, you know, having success as an entrepreneur and kind of his life story and, and the roller coaster rides he's had. So I enjoyed this because it's more of a personal story. He, you know, he's very good at storytelling, so he makes the book very easy to read. And, and so that was fun. And um, the one thing I really took away, uh, the first thing was he's talking about is you need deadlines to get things done. And you need to become a deadline setting master to beat procrastination. So. This is definitely one thing that I don't do enough of in my business, and it's probably because I don't have the accountability of anyone else to really push me to do something. So I have just started another business at the, at the moment with a couple of new partners, and with that one, I feel that accountability and that pressure and that kind of drive is there. And that's kind of good because it gives you motivation to keep doing something and, and just keep, uh, keep momentum. Um, but in my own business, you know, it's just been me, uh, and I started by myself, and I don't really have a, a big office or other people to kind of whatever push me on or drive me. Um, so deadlines is really important because it sets something concrete, a goal you need to aim for, and that's just the best way, the best way to beat procrastination. Um, what I've been doing, which has been working well, is to do these to-do lists every day. And you know, just after I meditate, I'll write down maybe the top three, four, or five things that I really want to get done, the really high value sort of items that if I get those things done, I'll feel like I've had some achievement and success that day. And that's quite important to feel like you've achieved something every day because it gives you that feeling of, you know, I've done something worth doing and I can go to bed feeling good. Whereas if you're just frantically running around all day, sometimes you get caught up doing very mundane stuff, very unimportant things, and the, and the really important things just never get done. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I do kind of set deadlines because I set the things and set the intention at the beginning of the day, what I want to get done. But I think I need to be looking further out, you know, one week, one month, three months, uh, what do I need to get finished? I've got so many projects on at the moment and I kind of move between them based on what I'm interested to work on, but that's not necessarily the most efficient way. In fact, it's probably not a good way of getting things done. I should probably be focusing on really important things that's going to drive revenue first uh, and then let everything else kind of sit. So I just haven't really prioritized that well in terms of identifying what's the high, you know, high target growth things, the growth projects I need to work on. Uh, building out webinar sales funnel is probably the one I identified after reading this book. And so I'm going to set myself a deadline, okay, I want to launch this webinar or whatever, launch this book, launch this project by this day. And then you work back to figure out, well, you work, you know, you, you, before you set a date, you work out what the critical path items are. So what the things are you need to get done, uh, how long those things should take, and then you set a deadline that's going to push you, but it's, you know, even if you don't hit that deadline exactly, you're having something to work towards. So every day you're kind of aware, okay, this deadline's a week away, three days away, how am I doing? And it just kind of really will give you more accountability to yourself to make sure you're focusing your time on the most important things because without the deadline you can procrastinate you can waste your time doing unimportant things and it's more to avoid that kind of activity which you know doesn't grow your business so just having the deadline will kind of clarify your vision and your focus uh, so you're moving in the right direction even if the if the goal changes it's fine you need to you need to set that deadline so i think that's that's quite powerful and, and himself he saw that you know when he became good at setting deadlines suddenly his success in his business took off so he says you need to be a deadline setting master to, to beat procrastination. Uh, he gives some kind of very general advice. I'm not going to cover on, on all those things. Uh, he does mention there's a course he does called Kick-Ass Copywriting Secrets of a Marketing Rebel. So obviously that's one of the things he's pitching in this book. And because this guy's a marketer, you know, he's pitching throughout the book. So you have to decide for yourself if it's, uh, if it's worth the value. But um, I got a lot out of the book anyway, so I would, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, one of the key tips he gives as well uh, it says, don't create the product until you get the polls from the market uh, because it's a waste of time and money. So he tells a story about someone he was working with, and this guy had spent $10,000 on a fancy website, you know, blowing lots of money, but he had he tested the idea to see if he, what he was selling, there was a demand for it. And then when he launched it, he, you know, threw out a bunch of advertising, nothing happened, no sales. Uh, and then when he, when he told John, what he was selling in his market, John did a research and figured out there's, there's not many people actually buying this. Whatever you're selling, is, is, there's no market for it. So before you invest a ton in you know, a new product, whether that be a physical product you're manufacturing, you need to go and do the market research. You need to test the market, see what the pulse is. Is there a demand for your product? 
So I was talking about how you test an idea in the market, and um, that's really easy to do today. You know, you've got Google. You can go on Google AdWords Keyword Planner, type in your product or service, what your location is, and you can see what are the keywords, what is the search demand like, who's actually looking for your service. Are you just searching, fishing in an empty pond, as he calls it? Um, so that's one really easy way. Uh, the other one he talks about for US is this, is this database called SRDS, and you can check what is your target demographic for you know something you're trying to sell. How many people are there out there actually in your in your target demographic? Uh, a much easier way to do that now is with Facebook. Obviously, Facebook. You know, most people are on Facebook now. You can log into Audience Insights in your Facebook account, and you can start to build up a demographic. Pick your age group, male or female, interests, behaviors. Facebook's got very very detailed profile um, profile capabilities, so you can build up this audience, and you can find out is there anyone actually looking for my product or service, or who how big is the market for what I'm selling because if there's nothing there, how are you going to reach them? Uh, and instead of you know doing direct mail like these guys had to do, it's very easy now just to go on Google and Facebook, throw up an advert, and test very very quickly. So you've, you've got to test before you launch something. Before you invest, just just do that test and, and you know spend a few hundred dollars and save a few save yourself a few thousand dollars when uh, when you do it the other way around. Um, the next one he talks about here is kind of funny. He says, beware of overly confident people. Um, because usually they're just hiding their own incompetence, hiding behind this facade of you know confidence, and so he calls them overly confident morons. And you know this is quite funny because I've probably encountered a few people like this. Uh, maybe they have very impressive presence on stage. They they sound like they know what they're talking about. Uh, people often get whipped up for this frenzy and this hype, and then they go and buy the product or whatever it is, and it turns out to be you know rubbish or they just haven't put the thought in. So the example he gives is these people driving SUVs. Uh, usually they're just doing it to hide massive insecurity, and it's kind of like a compensation thing. And that's a very classic uh, cliche, but um, beware of overly confident people trying to sell you things. Um, and if you're someone who appears more realistic and more human, and you kind of look at the pros and the cons of something, and you're not just like, yeah, this thing works, rah, 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 um, people will, they, you'll, you'll be more believable to people. And so that's kind of, I guess, a selling persona. Um, and he just gives a tip to look out for those type of people that are just overly confident. Um, the next tip is really good. This is probably the, my, my favorite takeaway from the whole book. He says, you know, it's not about bullying the reader into doing what you want. It's about speaking their attitude and their language. So the copy that you're writing should melt smoothly into the conversation that they're already having inside their head. And, and this might sound like it's difficult to do, but if you do your targeting and your demographics right, you can identify you know, what is the problem they're having, what are they thinking right now, and you start the conversation there. You don't start talking about yourself and how great you are and what you've been doing. And you know, they don't give a shit. No one gives a shit about that. Um, people want to know how you're going to help them, how you're going to fix their pain. And so if you can find out exactly where they are and what pain they're having, it's much more easy to write copy that just melts smoothly into that conversation. And suddenly it doesn't seem it doesn't even seem like you're selling to them because you're talking to them like you're talking to them from their perspective, from their language, uh, and that's just a much easier conversation to start having. And, and so this is something I've been thinking about a lot in terms of how I position and start to talk to business owners because, because I run a marketing agency and so I started doing SEO and now I do a lot of other things. But if you call up people offering SEO, offering websites, offering marketing, there's just so much noise in the market. They've been bombarded. They've been burned maybe two, three times by really bad service providers. And so you going in with that kind of pitch is instant shutdown. No one's going to want to listen to what you've got to say. Even if it's something that could help that business, it doesn't matter. You're just another guy of that hundreds of guys, phone calls they get, emails they get, and you're going straight in the trash can. But um, if you can call up and you can, well, first of all, if you can qualify your prospects. So if you can find out who is the type of person likely to need my service, and if there's so many tools out there now. I found a very, very cool tool uh, called Data Nice, which basically uh, it's an engine that goes out there and scrapes all these websites, and it looks for footprints of certain technologies being used. So basically, using this software, you can identify people that are using certain, uh, certain technologies, um, certain advertising platforms, certain call tracking platforms, and you can work out, oh, these are my ideal type of client. So let's say you're selling, um, sales, you're doing sales training or sales coaching. You can see all the companies that have recently bought Salesforce, which is a you know a sales CRM, and these these companies had to have a lot of money to drop down uh, a subscription for Salesforce because it's annual billing, so they're dropping like ten to fifteen thousand dollars down. 
The next thing John talks about is um, good headlines. What makes a good headline? He says using a resting headline. So this is some punchy copy that really hits their hot buttons. Uh, this is kind of similar to what I was talking about in the book of you for Dan Kennedy's book, The Ultimate Sales Letter. Uh, you know, using these power words and phrases that really emo invoke emotion in the senses uh, because that's how people buy. You need to hit their hot buttons. So that, that's his next tip. Uh, and then he tells a story about how he nearly went back into working for, uh, for a corporate uh, job and he, he had the interview and then he talked to someone in the copywriting department and this woman, you know, she seemed quite, uh, quite miserable and so he asked her, you know, what's, what's the matter, what, what's happening and why don't you have any pictures of your, you know, your family or your daughter on your, on your desk and she says that, you know, uh, the, this, the corporate rules, we're not allowed to have anything on our desk, we have a clear desk policy. Uh, and so basically this, these corporate rules were stifling the creativity and these people weren't happy. So um, he says that, you know, that, that's what persuaded him to, to realize he's not cut out to, to work in an office for someone else. He needs that, that freedom and that independence to, to choose what environment, have his own creativity uh, that's going to work best for him. And he says his office is very messy, so, um, so that's quite funny. He has things all over the place, um, but, you know, it's always reminding him. He was, he's always getting ideas from his environment of what to write about. Um, and he, he wouldn't function well in, uh, in an office environment that had such uh, stifling policies. So, um, yeah, that, that's quite true for me as well. I think that I don't work well uh, in the corporate environment as I do in kind of my own environment. I'm just more comfortable. Um, so I like that. Um, the next tip he says is that our brains are complex, but we crave simplicity. And uh, it's funny because I actually wrote down crave stupidity. So maybe that's a subconscious... Um, subconscious uh, thing I wrote there but uh, the idea behind that is you know we have obviously super complex brains but really if you want to sell to someone you have to keep it simple and the more uh, complicated something becomes the more confusing it becomes then suddenly you introduce doubt and confusion and, and then people don't buy so you need to be able to keep your pitch really simple uh, a lot of people do this you know is to run their, their uh, script through, um, through some software which shows what the average age level uh, reading comprehension level is, and you want to keep that level very low. Um, even they do the same with presidents now. You know, if you listen to a speech from 100 years ago, or you know, someone like Abraham Lincoln, the type of speeches they would give, it just wouldn't work today. People are super dumbed down, uh, and so you need to really, really simple uh, pitch. You look at one of President Obama's speeches; it's something any eight-year-old could could understand. So that's how you think you need to think about when you're selling. Uh, obviously, we all like to think our readers are intelligent, discerning people. Um, but really they, they do create simplicity and so you need to really really keep your pitch simple so I like that I like that takeaway I've, I've read that one before but it's uh, it's good to know he, he thinks the same thing um, the next tip he gives is you know one of the greatest secrets of salesmanship is secrets and you need to tease people and if people think they know everything about what you're selling they're not gonna hang around for your pitch and listen to what you have to say so they need to feel like you have some information they don't know and, and that's true right because we all know something the other person doesn't know so you just need to play on whatever that is and, and make them feel like there's some secrets that they're not privy to and that you're going to give them that information and share that with them and that's going to give them reason to stick around and listen to, to what you're pitching. So definitely secrets. I hear that all the time in all kinds of uh, sales videos. People using secrets as a way to tease people and keep them watching the video all the way to the end and then you know they get to hear the pitch as well. So I thought about how I could apply that story to you know to what I'm selling and basically my own story is how I had to evolve fast to, you know, to stay alive in my business and grow. So um, that's kind of why I like helping other entrepreneurs as well. But how can you apply that to whatever your product or service you're offering? Um, what's the secret that you have that your prospects need? Uh, how can you tap into that? So it's really powerful when you start to use, uh, integrate these things into your copy and your, you know, your sales pitch. So I wrote a bunch of notes for all the, all the kind of copy I'm going to use in some of my sales funnels. Um, the next point he mentions, which is, you know, it's kind of timeless, is that people are lusting after the same thing they always have, and that's sex, power, status, and wealth. So if you can kind of tap into those key, you know, those are the hot buttons. If you can tap into those key uh, emotions and, and desires, you know, you'll always have winning copy and, and stuff that sells. Uh, and as long as you do that in a way that's ethical, if you have a product that you believe can help someone, then you can play on these things, which, you know, you're playing to these desires, and, and that's kind of something that you see all the time in newspapers and advertising. It's why you have beautiful women in all the adverts and things like that. So um, sex, power, status, wealth, never forget that that's a powerful, uh, powerful way to sell. The next tip he gives is, you know, practice observation and storytelling. 
uh, because that's going to help you write good copy. So, you know, what do you see when you walk for lunch? And what did you do today? When you, when you ask those questions to people, uh, sometimes people have no idea. They're kind of just in their own head. They're blanking out. They don't really remember with any kind of vivid memory or clarity or recollection what happened during lunch. Um, and kind of I'm the same sometimes. I get stuck a bit in my head and I'll just be walking around town and I won't really pay attention to what's going on. But he says when you're able to practice observation, you know, you kind of imagine what people are thinking and the conversations they're having based on their emotions, how people are engaging with each other. Uh, that lets you, you know, write really powerful stories in your head and you can kind of use things from real life to, to write good copy. Um, so definitely practicing observation is a good thing to do anyways, being more aware of, of your environment, your surroundings, but it's almost like you're building a narrative in your head and you're kind of, you know, cataloging this, this, uh, these experiences into your brain. You then have a library of, you know, uh, of experiences and emotions that you can tap into to write good story and you can pull analogies from your life and, you know, make things more relevant when you're selling and that's just makes it more real, makes it more personal. So. Uh, that's something I need to work on is practicing my, my own observation uh, to, to get better at storytelling so, so that I can write better copy. Um, he says that, this is an interesting one, he says, you know, life is a banquet and most poor suckers are starving to death. So what he means is that people, people basically love to reminisce about the good old days. Uh, when they grow up, they feel like life is almost kind of passing them by. Uh, he gives an example of when he went to, you know, school reunion and he used to talk with people and they just seem to have lost the zest for life and they've kind of given up almost. They just settled that life is going to be boring. But, but they have these memories in their head of when they were young and when they were kids and how amazing life was. And so those are like very, very strong memories they hold on to. And that's a very, very powerful thing to tap into when you're writing copy um, is to give people that, you know, that excitement in their life that maybe they don't always have. Uh, maybe they just lost that over time because, you know, they settled into a nine to five and they just, their lives aren't very exciting. So... Yeah, if you can tap into those uh, sensations, help people connect with that, you know, those memories, that's really powerful. You can push them, you know, into that state and, and then, you know, offer whatever you're offering that's going to help them get what they need. Um, the next tip he gives is, you know, bond with your customers like a buddy. Uh, don't put them up on a pedestal. You know, you don't get to live with rose tinted glasses. Uh, as a marketer, you have to see all sides. Um, but basically, if someone thinks they're your friend, they're more likely to buy from you. So you need to be able to build rapport, and, and that's you know, a basic strategy of any kind of sell, selling is work out where do you have rapport with your customers, uh, what do you have in common, how do you bond with them. And that goes back to reminiscing you know, about your childhood and whatever memories your, your prospects might have that, that you know, ring true for you as well. Um, the next tip is interesting. He says the more opportunity... If you're going into a new product or a new market or you're expanding, he says the more opportunity there is in a market or product and the more money there is to be made, uh, the more heat and the grief you're going to encounter. So, uh, you know, he's, he talks about things like lawsuits, you know, your competitors suing you, um, con artists might be trying to get money from you. Like he just says certain industries, uh, they carry a lot of risk and, you know, they might, you might get a lot of heat and grief. Um, and I'm sure he has a lot of stories he doesn't, he doesn't give the details on, but he says it's something to be aware of that as you go higher up the, the food chain, the value chain, uh, you're going to find people that are very, you know, uh, protecting their own interests and maybe you're breaking into their market. And so you need to be very mindful of the market you're entering. What are the risks? Maybe you don't know until you get um, to a high enough level. You know, people might be interested in, in stopping you from taking over their, their market or things like that. So that's more of just general business advice uh, than, than copywriting, but that was interesting. Uh, the next one he talks about is positioning and basically how you position your product is key. Uh, so the example he gives, you know, at supermarket shelves, uh, whatever is the eye line is what's going to sell best. And that's why there's such fierce competition in the supermarkets. Um, they've done tests where, you know, they, they've, they've tested different types of advertising, different types of branding. You can spend millions of dollars on an on a advert, but if your product's on the bottom shelf, it is going to make a marginal difference. Whereas the big difference is where whichever product is instantly eye level because that's what people scan for and that's what they see. And nine times out of ten, that's where the buying happens. So, um, if your product is at the bottom shelf, you know, literally or figuratively, uh, then it's not going to sell. You need to think about how you position your product, um, and that's you know, that could be magazine ads as well. You know, there's a lot of studies done that the best sell, uh, the best selling ads, or the highest visibility ads, are the one on the inside covers on the very front. If your if your ads hidden in the middle of the end of the magazine, the back of the magazine, half the time no one sees it, and so you could be paying a lot of money for something. Uh, you always want to check when you're advertising, where is my ad going to appear, exactly which spot. 
um, to know how many eyeballs it's going to get. So yeah, with Google, you know, it's much the same. With Facebook, it's much the same. When you advertise, you kind of know where your ads are going to appear based on how much you're bidding. And you can see, oh, my advert's not even at the top three in Google. It's down here on the first page or it's on the second page. You know, maybe my website's not on page one of Google. This is just the same thing. There's no eyeballs there. There's no visibility. You might as well be invisible to, to, the, to most people. So, so you've got to think about positioning and where your, where your ads are being seen, how many people are going to see it. And obviously, the right type of people have to see it. So advertising the right magazines and the right supermarkets for whatever your product is. Um, then he talks about three things that's going to help people want what you're offering. And so how you need to think about this, the first one he says is, you know, I want, I want the prospect to see that this product is clearly necessary in his life. The second one is I want him to feel a desperate urgency where he must act right away or lose out forever. And the third one he says, I want him to see what is offered, that what is offered is of such high value that he would be a fool not to order immediately without delay. And again, those are all things about building up desire and urgency and pushing people to action. Um, so this, you know, you could do fast action bonuses. I talked about that. A lot of people do that in webinars. It's something that meets the needs and desires that you're building up throughout the video. And then suddenly, boom, you hit them with this, you know, uh, with this call to action, with a really fast action bonus. Push them to, push them to action. Um, and then he says that foreplay is the key to closing the sale. And that you need to get your prospect hot and bothered. And so most people are so bothered about the, the pitch. They're so worried about the pitch. But... The, the foreplay is what makes the pitch effective without a good build up, you know, building suspense, building desire, interest, curiosity. The, the pitch doesn't mean anything. So he says, of it, he says, think of it like teasing a couch potato into action when you're trying to get your prospects to, to buy something because that's really how they are most of the time, <laughs> which is quite funny. Um, and then he says, after the sale, remind them how much money they will make and how their life is going to change because you need to reinforce the sale. Uh, your goal is basically to make them a customer for life, so you need to continue that bonding after they buy and make them feel warm in your arms. And I guess this is, you know, this is important. If you, uh, if you sell something, you want to make sure people actually use it and get the value from it. You need to follow up with them, make sure they're using it, um, ask if they have any questions, you know, show that you still care about them, uh, and that way you make sure they actually use the product, they get the benefit of it. Otherwise, they may pick it up, not really understand how to use it, get stuck or something, and then ask for a refund and say, oh, this is, this is rubbish, I didn't, I didn't use it. So it also helps, you know, make sure you have a low refund rate. If your product's good, then, then that's, that's one tactic you can use. Um, the next one, he's, the next tip he gives is ignite a personal story lying dormant in your prospect's brain. So again, this is what I was talking about building rapport. If you go back in time to when people were young and they're reminiscing about the good life, that's a very powerful way to start a personal story because instantly, you're entering a story that's dormant in their in their brain, and, and that builds that builds excitement, that builds passion. And suddenly, you, you've got them on the hook; they're listening to you. Um, so that that's yeah, that's just part of good copywriting. Um, then he's got some tips for how to tell a good story. So, the first one here is you must involve the listener and anticipate questions they want to ask. So, because you're not going to be able to be in the room with these people if you're selling, you know, over a website or through a direct mail. Uh, on a webinar, you can't talk to everyone one to one and ask them. So you need to anticipate ahead of time what sort of questions are they going to have. And this is kind of what a FAQ is for, right? It's like a way to overcome any confusion or doubt in your prospect's head. Um, you need to make sure that you've thought about it from their perspective. What might stop them from buying? What do they want to know about the product or service? Uh, and all those things have to be addressed in your video, in your copy, in your in your sales letter. And he says, look for interesting undertones that add color and detail. So again, this is him just trying to you know build this story and and, and get their attention and desire, uh, and it comes with practice. I mean, there's some things you can do, you know, eighty twenty part of it. You can get a lot of right just by writing a good headline. Um, I wouldn't consider myself a great copywriter, but I've managed to you know lift my conversions just by testing the headline because that's the first thing people read. And once they read the headline, if they connect with that, they're much more likely to read the rest of the copy. And then you just have to get the next part right, the next part right, and the next part right. Uh, what I really like about video sales letters is you can actually test the engagement rate over time. Whereas, um, you know, with a sales letter, you can kind of do the same. You can see how far people scroll down before they leave the page. And you can kind of see, oh, there's some, maybe some message here that's not congruent or it's not clear. And you can change your copy and then see what happens using Crazy Egg or, you know, these heat map uh, click tracking softwares. Uh, put that on your website and you can see where people drop out. But, but I prefer video because it's more engaging, and you can also see the, the engagement rate where people are dropping out in your video. Uh, so you can use Wistia or some other video analytics software, and that's really powerful because it can tell you, you know, you, you're losing your prospects. 
you know, here, 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 and a typical curve is like this, you know, a lot will drop off and then a few will watch all the way to the end. And the more you can keep in all the way through, obviously, the more people hear your pitch, the, the higher your converter it's going to be. So, um, so that, that's quite a powerful tip I want to share. Uh, and then he says, oh, this is, uh, this is another book. So I'm going to stop there. That's, uh, that's all the tips for this book. And I uh, hope you find that useful. And I'll be putting this up soon. So thank you.